All right, good morning. Uh, we're ready for our next case, and that would be Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith, would you introduce yourself? Tell us your name and your DOC number, please. My name is Joseph Smith, 41 2040. All right, Mr. Smith, my name is Cheryl Renatsis, chairman of your parole panel today. This is Mrs. Pearl Wise to my left, Mrs. Bonnie Jackson to my right. Uh, let me just acknowledge we have uh, quite a few folks who joined us this morning by Zoom. Uh, we'll call on those who've indicated they'd like to speak at the appropriate time. We'll ask for their comments. Uh, we also have a representative, and that's representing the victim. We have a representative from the DA's office, uh, Mr. Yoakum, who has also asked to speak. We'll call on him at the appropriate time. Uh, here in support by Zoom, we also have a uh, friend, Mr. Sanders, we'll call her and him at the appropriate time. First, let me read some identifying information in the director, Mr. Smith, and then I'm going to turn it over to Mrs. Jackson. Your case has been assigned to her. She'll take the lead on you. Yes, ma'am. So, Joseph Smith, you're uh, classified as a first felony offender. You're currently serving a 60-year sentence, having been sentenced in Webster Parish in May of 1999 for attempted second-degree murder. You received a 50-year sentence. In fact, you received a 10-year sentence. They're running consecutively. Your parole eligibility date has been January 8th. No, I'm sorry. It's January 8th of 2024. Uh, your adjusted good time day is October 28, 2043. Full term is February 27, 2068. Is that information correct, sir? Yes, ma'am. All right. Would you answer Mrs. Jackson, please? Good morning, Mr. Smith. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? I'm, I'm fine. Thank you. Uh, you're 44 years old, Mr. Case, Mr. Smith, rather. Yes, ma'am. And how long? I'm Forty-four you, years ago. How long have you actually been incarcerated? Both juvenile and adult. I would have to say, uh, probably uh, on this charge. On this charge, twenty-five years. Of a sixty-year sentence. Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. What, what were you incarcerated for? Juvenile. Excuse me? What were you incarcerated for at Juvenile? Uh, when I was at Central State Hospital for behavioral problems, I blacked out and attacked one of the staff. And I was charged in the juvenile court there in Rapids Parish. You say it. Of the staff, what exactly did you do to the staff person? Apparently, I choked them and they pressed charges on me, and I went to uh, the juvenile place there in Scotland, where I was then transferred from there to Tallulah Boot Camp. And how long were you incarcerated as a juvenile? I think six months to a year. It is real blurry. Uh, at one point, did you live in Texas? Yes, ma'am. Were you hospitalized uh, or institutionalized in Texas? Yes, ma'am, for behavioral issues. I tell, uh, first, how old were you when you were uh, in a mental health facility? I was 14 years of age. And how long did you stay there? For roughly about a year and a half. Then I got transferred from there to. Stop, stop, I, hold up. Just hold up. What behavioral issues caused you to be uh, hospitalized in a mental facility? I had a very bad anger issue when I was a child. And it was my downfall. What did you do? Oh. What, what actions caused you to stop in the mental institution? What did you do and to whom did you do it? 
I lashed out at my family continuously. I would, in what ways? I would chase them around the house with weapons. weapons. Yes, ma'am. Wow. And sometimes I even chased them outside the house. And did you harm anyone physically? No, ma'am. Ever? Not Am at I that time. Not at that time, no, ma'am. Um, so you were adopted, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. So let's go to the date of this incident. Uh, walk me through your actions on the day that you murdered your adopted mother. I was at home. I was sitting down in the room watching TV. And she came into the room and she was angry and getting uh, on my case about not having done something. I, I don't remember exactly now what it, exactly it was, but I just remember that we argued and something in my head, I guess, just, just broke or snapped, whatever you want to call it. And it was like I was there, but not there. It was like I was seeing myself, what, seeing what, what I was did you do? What did you do? What did you see yourself doing? I saw myself with what looked like tunnel vision choking her, but. Well, let's slow down. I, my dad said that I broke her neck, but. Sheriff Steve, uh, uh, Chief Stevens said I choked her. I don't really remember everything that went on that night. I mean, I, this, I, uh, think you, I think you remember more than you are disclosing to this board because you were interviewed by the police. They talked to you, but you gave statements to them. And so clearly, you know, at some point in time, you were aware of what you had done and you gave statements about what you had done. And so even if at, in the moment you didn't remember, you certainly remember the things that you told law enforcement. When Chief Stevens started telling me about what was found inside the house, it was basically jogging my memory. And this was before he put okay. everything on the tape. Tell me what, what, what was jogging your memory? Do you remember from what he, he was? He was describing the way the furniture was in the room, where it happened, how the hope chest was knocked askew, and What, he, physical, he, what physical injuries did you cause to your mother? I remember sitting down on the bed next to her, putting my arm around her neck. And the last thing I heard her say was, Joseph, you're scaring me. And I, next thing I remember, I was outside in the hallway. And I got scared. I tried to put her in the trunk of the car. Well, that's back up. I think you're leaving out some stuff. Not a lot of stuff. Uh, according, let me, let me get my right. But I this correct. Okay. Uh, what I pulled up in front of me, uh, 
uh, is the autopsy um, report. Uh, she, the manner of death was uh, cause of death was manual strangulation. She had extensive hemorrhage of the neck to include the right and left, and he uses a medical term for the muscles, contusions of the larynx, contusion of the thyroid uh, gland, and the left uh, pericardial artery. She had contusion, abrasions, and lacerations of the head and neck. So that means that she was hit in the head or about her head and neck with some object. So what did you hit her with? I don't, I honestly do not remember hitting her with anything. I remember we fell to the ground. That much I do remember. I don't remember hitting her in the head with anything. She, because had, we, she <laughs> had fusions and abrasions to the right lower extremity. Uh, she had uh, contusions to the back. She had a broken back. She had a fracture of the lumbar vertebra. So that's not a vertebra in the neck. That's a vertebra in the lower back. And so her neck was not, her back was broken uh, either by kicking or by hitting her with some object. She also had fractured ribs. And I believe this woman was in her 50s, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. And so it's not like she was an 80-year-old woman who had, you know, fragile bones. So in order for her to have fractures of her rib, fracture of her vertebra, and all of the contusions that were on her body means that this was a vicious attack on your mother. And I will tell you that, um, you know, one of the things that I look for is honesty. And it's convenient for you to say that you don't have to remember these things, but you can't forget this. This is too extensive. I think most of that damage was done when we when we fell off and we fell off what? That hope chest. Because wow. the hope chest the hope chest was at the foot of the bed. And I think that's what she hit. Because it was literally knocked askew. And it left I Considerable I, scratches in the hardwood floor. Well, that's that's if that's what you want to say, that's fine. You don't break your back from falling the off your bed onto a hook chest at the front of the bed. It doesn't happen that way. It's impossible to happen that way. She also had trauma and lacerations to her genitalia which indicated to the coroner that she had been sexually assaulted with a, some sort of object in her vagina because of the lacerations, contusions, and abrasions. So not only did you beat her, you also sexually assaulted her. So why would you sexually assault your mom? I didn't. I tried to use one of the brooms in the broom closet as leverage to try to lever her into the back of the trunk of the car. And so I, you, told her, I told her, I told her, the same put thing. It, uh, you put it in her vagina? No, not intentionally. I didn't. Well, well you know, it, it's hard to accidentally put a broom in somebody's vagina. 
Ma'am, I, I was barely a buck 15 back then. I don't care. Anatomically, you cannot accidentally put a broom in somebody's vagina. Now, you know, you, you've taken a lot of programs. Uh, you, you had 54 write-ups, but the last one was um, 2004. You got letters of support. Uh, but those things kind of pay off in comparison to what you did to your mom. Failed in comparison. Also, there is adamant, adamant opposition from everyone in the entire community where this occurred and your family has written uh, numerous letters to the board outlining specific instances where you have terrorized them and other members of your family over the course of time until it culminated in the murder of your mother. So given those, those realities, Mr. Smith, why would this board ever consider releasing you back into society? I can honestly say nothing in my defense that would justify anything that I've done in the past. I was a monster back then. I get that. Well, let me ask you I, this. How, I, does, how does, I mean, I'm a monster. I mean, when you say a monster, what do you mean when you say you were a monster? I didn't trust anybody. I didn't like myself. I didn't even like people that were around me back then. That doesn't manifest itself in you know, cruelty, violence, murder. What they're not trying to tell you is I even tried to take my own life several times before that even happened. Well, unfortunately, but that's not, I'm not saying that to garner sympathy or anything like that. I'm just stating fact. Why were you unsuccessful if you, you, you don't have any trouble? Because, because my parents kept a 24-hour watch on me everywhere I went. In Why, did they have to do that? Why did they have to do that? You would have to ask my dad that. Because I have no clue. Have no clue. I have no All the no. behavioral issues that you outlined, some that sent you to juvenile detention, some that sent you to a mental health facility, and you don't have any idea why your family had to keep those watch. Well, that's what I'm saying. Be honest, Ms. Jackson, I have no clue. I, I, I don't. I'm, I'm at a loss for words. I am not who I used to be. And I refuse to let that define who I become. You know, Mr. Smith, you're in a controlled environment. That I am. You are. And you have adapted to a controlled environment. But it's fair to say, don't you think, that when you're not, when you were not in a controlled environment, you were a monster. That's your words, not mine. You were a monster. And so, you know, our concern as a board is if you're out of that controlled environment, you're still a monster. You're just in a controlled see that you've had any kind of psychological evaluations while in prison or on, on any kind of psychiatric treatment? Do you think you have a psychiatric disorder? I'm currently
currently under psychiatric medication. Well, in what condition? What's your diagnosis? PTSD. That's it. I'm taking, I'm taking PTSD medication as, as well as antipsychotic medication. I'm taking, in fact, I'm taking the same antipsychotic medication that I was taking 25 years ago that I flat out refused to take 25 years ago with any kind of regularity. And, and it seems to be working. And it seems to be working. When we saw what happened. Because I wasn't taking my medication like I was supposed to. That's not uncommon for people with mental health disorder. And if you're police, there's no um, way anyone can force you to take medication. My conscience would force me to take it. Because the alternative is spending the rest of my life in prison, something I don't want despite how much my family and the community may hate me. Are they justified? I, I, don't, I don't expect them to forgive me for everything I've done. In fact, I wouldn't fault them if they did. But the fact still remains, I am not the same person I used to be. This is the... This is Ms. Jackson, this is the longest of my entire incarceration that I've ever been in general population without a single write-up, going to go without going to the dungeon at any given time. When I was in Angola, they used to be like Motel Six, we'll keep a light on for you. That's how frequent I was catching write. Ida. Captain the Villa Camp C in 2000 said, Mr. Smith, aren't you tired of going to the dungeon? I said, yes, sir, I am. What kind of things were sending you to the dungeon? It all stems. I know not, I'm not saying my right. What kind of things did you do that sent you to the dungeon? And we do have a list of all of these. Well, I know you do. I know you do. Tell me what kind of things were sending you to the dungeon. It all stems from a December 30th, 1999 write up when security wrote me up due to a confidential informant stating that I had was one of the two masterminds behind the Captain Knapp's incident at Camp D, which was BS because Major Malone's song proved me innocent after the fact. And he, at that time, he was the head of investigations. And that's what got me released back out in the general population barely six to eight months later. Have you had 54 separate write-ups? I've had exactly 49. Most of them, most of them were, I guess you call them the same write-up, different rules. Fractures on the same right up, but yes, I guess you could see it that way. Yes, but most of them were because security either did not want me in their camp or in their farm line because they were trying to garner favor with Warden Kane. Same way with the same way with that right up from 03 back in Camp D. Why would they need to you to gain favor with Warden Kane? Because everybody knew back then that I was on his it list. And why would you be on his hit list? I mean, Warden Kane has seen had seen the worst of the worst of the worst. So why would you be on his hit list? I didn't say hit list. Whatever list. Because I was not supposed to leave. I was supposed to be left to languish in a shell for practically the rest of my jokes. 
behind something I had nothing to do with. That even the sergeant in the dorm said I had nothing to do with. That everybody in the camp knew I had nothing to do with. I see you still harbor a lot of anger from that. I have a lot of distrust when it comes to security, yes. And I do sometimes get a little bit agitated, yes. Oh, because okay. I have. I'm concerned about what happens when you get a little agitated. Because the last time you got a little agitated, you got a little agitated. your mom sexually assaulted. And I'm, I'm going to tell you, uh, Mr. Smith, I do view you as a threat to society. I do. Well, I apologize for wasting everybody's time. Or what can you uh, add? What can you I'm, add? I'm truly sorry for everybody's time. Uh, or uh, what can you add? Ms. Jackson, y'all touched on uh, most things that I wanted to, to talk about. You mentioned his improved conduct record since 2015, which, and uh, he has participated in numerous, numerous programs since 2015. He received his GED in 2012. And uh, he did have a restoration of some of his good time. I think I've, I've given him back uh, over 200 days, uh, close to 300 days of good time out of the 500 something that he's lost since his incarceration. Some of the, some of the write-ups I've uh, uh, excluded from his restoration of good time because of the nature of the RVRs and other things. So then he can apply for those, uh, he can reapply for those at a later date. Uh, just to clear up the, uh, Mental health issue on the institutional progress report you have, he's noted as a level of care 5H. That changed in May of this year, uh, and you probably haven't gotten, gotten that because it's, it's very current, very recent. When he saw Dr. Seal and his uh, level of care is now a level of care 4, and he did receive that uh, mood disorder and post-traumatic stress disorder diagnosis on that day, May the 10th. And he saw Dr. Seal again on May the 31st of this year. So those are that's very recent. Uh, so that's why it's not included in the in the report that you have. Uh, and and uh, he did start him on medication on on uh, May the 10th as well. But prior to that, he'd been uh, close to three years without any consult with mental health. He was uh, he was he, he did not seek any uh, services for mental health. So this is new. It just started in May. I just wanted to point that out. And, and I haven't, I'm open to any questions if you have any, Judge Jackson. I think you've addressed them, uh, Warren. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. um, Mr. Smith, you mentioned that you are in general population now. How long have you been in general population? I've been in general population this time since, what is it, 2014, I believe? Okay. Yes, all right. 2014, 2015, without looking, it's been, it's been several years, Mr. Knox, seven or eight years. And I've been in the honor dorm since the end of 2015. Okay, good. Um, I tell you, we'll hear now, we have Mr. Van Sanders here who wants to speak in support. Mr. Sanders, could we hear from you, sir? Um, let me unmute. Can you hear yes. me? Yes, okay. sir. All right. I've known, uh, well, I met Joseph in uh, 20, 20, uh, 2014 when I started uh, visiting the men at David Wade uh, basically for uh, Bible study, Bible study programs. And what I'll say is this, is that during that time, as recently, you know, as last night, because we, we had a program last night, and he has, uh, I can say he has impressed me with his sincerity, his compassion, and how he looks at other people. He's one of the ones, like, most recently, we 
we found out we had a young man there, but well, he isn't that young, but he cannot read, he cannot write. Joseph was one of the first ones to volunteer to help him, to teach him how to read and how to write. So he could be, so he could, uh, I guess you could say, melt back into society and be somebody that could really help. Joseph is also one of the men that doesn't mind speaking out for his faith and letting people know that, yeah, I've done some things, some, as he says, some horrible things. He's even, he's even told us that you just don't know how much of a monster I was before. Now I'm walking the road, and it's not an easy road to walk for him. And he knows that. The thing that he, that impressed me probably the most is his uh, sincerity as far as for what the crime that he committed, that if he could do it all over again, as far as not living that part of his life, he would gladly not live that part of his life. And I would say there's a man that has, uh, that left from there. And uh, we keep in contact because he's, uh, he's off parole and everything. And he said one thing about Joseph. He said, when Joseph first came to David Wade, he was a bitter, angry man. And he's watched him change. And he's changed for the good. Yes, he could have made it a crime. But at what point do we give him a chance to come back to society. And that's what I would say. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Sanders. We appreciate your input. Um, now we'll hear from the opposition. First of all, could we hear from Daniel? Okay, thank you very much, board. I appreciate your time. My name is James Daniel Smith. Uh, can you hear me, board? Yes, sir. Thank you. I am the oldest son of James and Billy Smith. I've known Joseph since my parents adopted him over 40 years ago. And in that time, he has always had a malicious intent to his behavior. There have been people whom I love very dearly come into my life in the last 25 years that I fear greatly should Joseph be released on parole, their lives and mine would be in grave danger. I know that while incarcerated, Joseph has obtained his GED and attended other educational classes. I also know that he has disciplinary reports, many of those around 54, against him for fighting, disobedience, and theft just within the last 10 years, which makes me strongly believe with all my heart that he has not changed. We all know that actions speak louder than words. So please, I beg you, take that to heart when considering his parole. He may try to convince you that he has changed and is able to re-enter society, but I strongly believe a person of his evil character and past violence will never change enough to be a productive member of society. There are too many lives at stake and in tremendous danger should he be released on parole. He will always, always, I cannot stress that enough, always, 
be a threat to society. Over the last 25 years, I've had to learn how to live with depression and anxiety due to the events of my mother's passing. I was told of my mother's death after being pulled out of class by campus police at ULM in Monroe, Louisiana. I suffered greatly from chronic headaches due to the stress of managing my classes at the university there in Monroe, Louisiana and life without her. To this day, my anxiety and depression will affect me, but thanks to a loving family and professional help, I'm able to cope and live with these diseases. I strongly urge you not to release this person, Joseph Smith, from his confinement as it would be detrimental to my and my family's lives. How would you feel if you knew the person who killed your mother was released on parole and then kills more innocent people, including you and your entire family? Thank you for listening and thank you for your time and attention to this grave matter and situation. Thank and now you. John will speak next. All right, we'd like to hear from Mr. John. Thank Good you. Good morning. Um, thank you for the opportunity to, to speak today. Uh, my name is John Gertis. Um, the offender is my first cousin. I have known Joseph most of his life, of course, until he was incarcerated. Um, and I have I've never observed Joseph behave in a way that would indicate that he was born with a conscience and very unfortunately there is no known way to correct that. Um, Joseph exhibits the traits of someone with antisocial personality disorder and congruent with the definition as stated in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, which are self-centeredness, a lack of empathy, persistently deceitful, disregard of promises or agreements, <clears throat> violent behavior, persistent irritability, and may react with sadism when confronted by the fallout of his actions. And we know that Joseph reacted with sadism against his mother, my aunt, Billy Smith. It's there in the autopsy report, which you've already covered, thankfully. I don't have to touch on that. Um, but it was, a, it was a closed casket at the funeral based on what he had done to her. The autopsy describes an aggravated first degree rape, which is a crime that carries a life sentence without parole in the state of Louisiana. For some reason, prosecutors did not pursue a conviction for that crime. We can only speculate why. The change in statute back in 2015 or 2016 that allows for early parole eligibility does not appropriately contemplate a circumstance like this where an offender may not have been fully charged with all of the crimes he committed. He raped and murdered not just any person, it was his own mother, my Aunt Billy. Joseph cannot be released for, for two main reasons. First and most importantly, he's a violent psychopath that poses a significant risk to surviving victims and the general public. And second, releasing Joseph after such a short time, after the way he brutally beat strangled and raped her is a violation of her memory. He owes us, at a minimum, another 35 years. He stole a beloved family member from us. And you, the board, have the power to make this situation right by denying his parole now and extending his next opportunity for parole another 35 years at least. It is insane to think that we, the victims, should be put through this exercise ever again um, thank you for your time. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, I'll pass it to Angela. Thank you, Mr. Gardas. We'd like to hear from Ms. Angela Brightfield, please. You're on mute. Can you unmute your microphone?
Sorry, sorry about that. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Thank you both, Daniel and John. And um, thank my name is Angela Harris Brakeville, and my parents and the offenders' parents were best friends. I called them Aunt Billy and Uncle James, and Joseph called my parents Aunt Bert and Uncle James. I've had first not hand knowledge of Joseph since I was 11 and a half years old, and he was born and became a smith. The love that our family shared was exceptional. Daniel and John have just spoken from their hearts and an extreme personal experience. I know that you have numerous letters and other people on this Zoom call or watching on YouTube or other ways who are all in extreme opposition to, Daniel, to um, Joseph's early parole. Some are very reluctant or fearful to step forward because they know firsthand what Joseph has done in his lifetime to his loving mom. They also fear what he will do if he is released. I understand their reluctance and fear. Joseph Benton Smith was prosecuted and convicted for murder to and theft of her car for reasons unknown to us. He was not prosecuted for the heinous sexual crimes, that, but that does not mean that it did not happen. As you may have heard um, and have the autopsy that was covered, um, um, I appreciate that you did cover that. Um, it is unbelievable to know that Joseph did rape his own mother. Joseph is a murderer and a rapist. Joseph's crimes were violent and egregious. And the scary thought and known fact is that his acts will occur again. You may wonder about the kind of man that Joseph was back in 1980, 1998. He may look older now, but I will assure you he is the same dishonorable man today. I see that he has completed his GED, and though that is to be noted, it does not denote rehabilitation. It does not miraculously provide someone with a moral compass. The difference between right and wrong were not missing in Joseph's life. His parents, his extended family and friends, his church family, his school system were there to love, lead, and guide and help instill these morals and the countless professional attempts that everyone tried to get him. A perfect example of Joseph being a master manipulator, as referenced earlier today, is a relationship with my then boyfriend, Clayton. Joseph was six when they met and they formed an exceptional immediate bond. Joseph never, not once, had any negative behavior when Clayton was around for 13 years until he killed Aunt Billy controlled his frightening manipulative behaviors from Clayton the entire time. I actually didn't hear an apology from Joseph today about killing him, uh, Aunt Billy. Um, there are four main reasons that people are placed in jail. The first is retribution, punishment for crimes against society. Society has been safer since Joseph has been in prison since 1998. He must serve his sentence in entirety. The second is deterrence, prevention of future crimes. Joseph is being deterred, but his behavior is not being changed for the future as prisons wish in this case. Incapacitation making one incapable of committing a crime. The only way to incapacitate him is to keep him locked up. Rehabilitation, rehab does help many people work to change their behavior and become productive members of society. However, Joseph will never be able to improve his behavior, mental health and social functioning to become a productive citizen of society. In closing, you, the board, have a very difficult job, and we thank you for what you do. The last thing is I kindly ask you to focus on the Louisiana board's mission, vision, and values statement. The mission is of the board is informed decision-making, promoting public board safety and needs of crime victims, 
We have informed you, the board, with valuable information to make the informed decision, thereby promoting public safety, addressing the needs of crime victims, and we believe we have shown you that Joseph is not ready for a successful community reentry and cannot be appropriately prepared, not even could, supervised. Could the you vision, wrap it up for us, ma'am? Could yes. you wrap it up for us, please? Yes, ma'am. The board has been shown evidence that um, the, he is not intended to promote, to be able to be released. It's not tangible considering the vision, the values of the ethics and integrity had ethics, integrity, and morals been in play, we would not be in this place. Therefore, we are imploring you to deny Joseph's parole and set off any future parole possibilities to a date as far as possible. If this Villa sinister man is granted parole, we will all be in grave danger of his own self-description of a monster along with society in general. Thank you, board, for your time. We sincerely appreciate you. Thank you. Could we hear from the DA's office now, please? Mr. Yoko. Good morning, members of the panel, and thank you for your time. <clears throat> I'd like to draw the panel's attention to what Mr. Smith says were most likely his mother's last words on earth, and that's, you're scaring me. Uh, those words 25 years later seem to be echoed even greater by the family in, of the victim. Our office has been inundated with calls of concerned citizens local elected officials and family members who also echo that same sentiment of fear of Mr. Smith. In 1998, he committed one of the most heinous crimes ever committed in Webster Parish due not only to his brutality, but its sexual nature upon his own mother, a crime that's still spoken of often within our community, one that is often referenced as the uh, one of the most terrible things to happen in the little town of Spring Hill. As you've heard Mr. Smith today, uh, he still shows, it seems, little remorse outside of the regret of the impact it's had on his life. He, in his own admission, has problems with security, authority. He um, has, has distributed or exhibited very little issues, I guess you could say, um, with any type of uh, authority of any kind. It is our position, that my, my position personally and of this office, that if he's released, he will commit further crimes, and most likely violent crimes. Those that have called us, I've asked to describe how he was back then, uh, the people that went to school with him and were around him, and all of them said that he was violent, temperamental, uh, and manipulative. Those are characteristics which seem to be uh, streamlined in his character, and we would ask um, that this board deny his parole, and we thank you so much for your consideration today. Thank you. We appreciate the DA's input. All right, uh, Joseph, is there a statement you'd like to make to the board before we uh, before we go? Yes, ma'am, there is. First of all, I was caught off guard by this whole hearing because first time ever being up on it. Plus, I've been up all night, couldn't sleep a week because I was dreading this whole hearing. If I seem to be uncaring or impartial, I may give off that effect, but that does not necessarily mean it's so. I am utterly ashamed of myself. I was debating as to whether or not to file the paperwork or not file the paperwork. I let other people talk me into filing the paperwork. Maybe people have changed, but I can honestly see people have not changed, despite those around them are trying to change. If I can find forgiveness, and forgive myself for what I did to my family, to the hurt and harm I caused my family all those years ago. And everybody who has ever known me, it's got to end somewhere. The chain has got to be broken somehow. If it doesn't start with me, then who does it start with? I don't know. 
That's what I've been trying to find out for the past 25 years. I don't know if you received that packet of certificates I mailed to y'all or not. Yeah. That's why I've been searching for 25 years, doing constantly what I've been doing. I'm not perfect. Name me one person who is. Guys, if you need to wrap it up for us. As I said before, if I could tell my family that I was sorry, I am. I can't stress how sorry I am. I'm the lowest of human beings on the face of this earth. Nobody knows that more than me. But once again, I'm sorry for wasting everybody's time today. All right, Joseph. Thank you. I think we'll be voting. We'll start with Mrs. Jackson. Mr. Smith, uh, as I said earlier, you've done a lot of programs and accomplished some good things while you're incarcerated. Uh, but that's in a controlled environment. Uh, when I look at the totality of this case, look at your history, even your demeanor today, you, know, you there were points in this interview that you were getting angry. I could see the anger rising up in you. Uh, you know, sometimes things that you have accomplished can in no way, no way, uh, overcome the nature of the crime that you committed. And unfortunately for me, this is one of those cases. It was a horrific crime, absolutely horrific. There have been demonstrated instances of violence throughout your youth, even from a small child. And some of those things are ingrained in you, Mr. Smith. They can't be programmed out. And so because of the nature of the crime, because of the adamant opposition, not only from the victims, but the entire community. And my belief that you continue to pose a risk to society, my vote today is to deny your request for philosophy. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Joseph. I, I listened, uh, I wanted to uh, thank uh, Billie Jean's family uh, for how well you honored her today. She, she must have been a really wonderful person for you all to do. And, and my condolence to you for your loss. Um, Joseph, say her name. You never said her name. Sharon, Billy Sharon High Smith. We voted now. We voted now. You didn't say her name. You've had Toastmasters International. You've done an outstanding Toastmasters. You, you displayed those skills excellently here this morning. Very well. But my vote is denied as well for the reasons already stated on the way. My vote also is to deny for the reasons that's already been stated. So today, Mr. Smith, your parole's been denied. Thank you, Ms. Renata. I believe that's the last case of way today. Hang on. Oh. Yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you, Warden Goodwin, for accommodating us today. We're going to move on. It's 939. God, have a great day. Did they leave? Wow. I'm not quite sure how to even unpack this one. There's nothing, no documents that I could find on this case, so I can't dive into anything. This, uh, we've seen a lot. We have seen a lot of antisocial criminals. We have seen some terrible crimes, but there was something about this man that was, as he called himself, a monster. I mean, even in his own hearing, he can't, he can't control himself. You can feel the rage 
bubbling or just emanating through the screen. Like I, I became tense listening to him talk. I feel my like anxiety. You could hear it from, you know, Miss Jackson. I've never really heard her be more confrontational in an interview than, than in this one. And I'm so glad that she had this case. She handled it as, as, as good as she possibly could. You know, you don't want to try very hard not to judge people on their, just by their looks, but it, 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 even in his face, it just looks, it looks, he looks um, scary. It's like there's something unnatural there. And even in his final statements, it was to place blame on other on other people. So somehow I think allude to other people not changing, even though he is trying to change. I don't. It, he didn't even want to apply. Other people made him do it. Everyone's out to get him. The warden's out to get him. Everyone's out to get him. It's like he's just not aware at all about how he uh, appears to everyone else. And everything was blaming other people. And he was adopted. I don't know, missed it if you mentioned it at what, what age, but just to, this is something out of, out of the terror movies where it seems like a beautiful family brings, adopts someone, and then he does that. And then he does that to his own mother. And he makes, tries to make an excuse that the broom, because he was trying to move her body. Miss Jackson just shut it down. The things that were being said at this hearing, it's like, am I actually hearing this correctly? Are we actually having this conversation? When you think you've seen it all, Louisiana Board of Paroles will remind you that we have not. Yeah, this man needs to, there are certain people we've seen it here that need to be kept locked up for the protection of society. This person is really dangerous, scary. You have to feel so much pain for the family and fear that they have to be put through this. And remember, it's not a commutation hearing. It's a parole hearing. Because of the sentencing, it's not like he needs a governor to sign off on it. It's up to the, the board. Now, the way things are, I don't believe he will ever get out. These are one of those cases where it's it's not going to happen. I wish I had more to add on this. With that, I'll let you go.